to invite over here Dr. Chris Elliott, Queen's University in Belfast, UK. Chris is currently Professor of Food Safety and Founder of the Institute for Global Food Security at Queen's University, Belfast. He served as Pro Vice Chancellor responsible for the Medical and Life Sciences faculty between 2015 and 2018. He has published more than 460 peer review articles, many of them relating to the detection and control of agriculture, food and environmental related contaminants. These have gained over 10,000 citations. Protecting the integrity of the food supply chain from fraud is also a key research topic. And Chris led the independent review of Britain's food system following the 2013 meat scandal. He currently coordinates a flagship Horizon 2020 project involving 16 European and 17 Chinese partners on food safety and also coordinates a European Institute of Innovation and Technology flagship research project. Over the years, Chris has developed a high level of network of collaborators across Europe, the United States, the Middle East, India and Asia. He is a visiting professor at the China Agriculture University in Beijing and the Chinese Academy of Sciences and Tamaset University in Thailand. He is a recipient of a Winston Churchill Fellowship and is an elected fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry and Royal Society of Biology. Chris has received numerous prizes and awards for his work. In 2017, he was awarded the Royal Society of Chemistry Theophilus Redwood Prize and was also awarded an OBE by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. He was elected a member of the Royal Irish Academy in 2020. So with this uh, brief introduction, uh, Dr. Chris Elliott, I would like to welcome him over here to speak on fighting global food crime with analytical chemistry. So can we please have the AB? Hello there. My name is Chris Elliott. I'm professor of food safety at Queen's University, Belfast in the United Kingdom. I'm also the founder of the Institute for Global Food Security. It's my great pleasure to present at this AOAC meeting. I really wish I could have been there in person. and I very much hope next year that I will be. So I wanted to talk a little bit about <clears throat> some of the work that we have undertaken in my research group in terms of using analytical chemistry to fight crime, criminal activity in the world's food supply system. This slide shows what the world food supply system is like, highly complex. And when you get complex systems like this, things can go wrong, accidentally or on purpose. And when I talk about on purpose, I'm going to give you some information about when people set out to cheat the food supply system, deliberately adulterate food for, for uh, financial gain. I, I refer to this as food crime, <clears throat> criminal activity in the food supply system. And you know, there's many, many victims of food crime. And first of all, thinking about the major trading routes of agriculture and food commodities <clears throat> that happen across the world, and this, this map shows that very nicely. But we have another map <clears throat> which shows pretty much the same trading routes except this, you know, the trading routes of organized criminal activity, eat narcotics, people smuggling, firearms, counterfeiting. The trading routes are very similar. And those people involved in this type of criminal activity are also highly involved in food crime activity as well. Now, what does fraud in food look like? And the first type of, of example is we call it substitution fraud and that's where goods of a high value are replaced with lower value goods. <coughs> An example is the horse meat scandal that happened right across Europe in 2014 and that was where beef was being replaced by very low value, low quality horse meat. Another example that happens in many parts of the world is fraud with olive oil. <coughs> and you get substitution of much lower 
quality types of, of vegetable oils <laughs> into olive oil, again for people just to make money. Next type of fraud is, we call it addition fraud, <clears throat> and that's where something is added to food to give it a perceived higher value. We've done a lot of work with herbs and spices in terms of adding things to it, because a lot of the, the particularly the spices in the world are traded based on the colour, and you can get uh, industrial dyes being added to spices <clears throat> to make them seem of higher value. The same is true with milk, and we had massive scandals in terms of the addition of, of fraudulent <coughs> sources of nitrogen to milk to cheat the system. We also have frauds associated with what we call false claims. The labels that are on food and things that guide us, that, that help us make our decisions about our food purchases. And that might be the country of origin has stated that it's welfare friendly, organic, fair trade. If these claims are made and they're not true, again, it's a form of fraud. I've investigated fraud in the global food supply system for a long time, more than 30 years. <clears throat> and my experience is whenever you set out to try to detect the fraud <coughs> and, and, and you find a way to do it, the criminals will find another way to cheat. And the reason for that is because so much money is made. More, more money than, than is made in the world's narcotics trade, for instance. The, the amount of money made in the world food supply system by fraud is estimated to be in the region of 40 to 50 billion US dollars. That's a lot of money. In terms of those people who are cheated, first of all, it is us, <clears throat> it is the citizens. We face economic losses and we also feel that we've been cheated by the food industry. But the food industry itself is a victim. <clears throat> those companies that get involved in, the, in, in criminal activity in food supply systems, they feel like they've let their customers down. <clears throat> it's a cause of massive reputational damage and companies can, can face massive, massive financial losses. But I am a professor of food safety and I'm, I'm most interested in the things that impact human health. So I talked about the fraud in milk and we go back 10 years to the melamine scandal in India and that was actually cheating an analytical test. Because milk is valued based on the amount of protein that's present and the amount of protein is men measured using the Keldal nitrogen method. The fraud was adding different sources of nitrogen to the milk to make it seem like there, there was more protein present. And that source of nitrogen was melamine, byproduct of the plastic industry, a little bundle of, of nitrogen. The big issue was that when it was ingested, <coughs> that melamine started to polymerize and started to cause massive damage to the kidneys, particularly of young children. And it's estimated that more than 300,000 infants were hospitalized in China and there were a number of fatalities associated with it. The cheating that I referred to in terms of the spices and the addition of colors, quite often those are industrial dyes, things like Sudan Red, and those are very toxic agents and will, will, will exert their toxicity over a prolonged period of exposure, chronic exposure. Fraud can even impact on our religious beliefs. <clears throat> For instance, fraud in terms of kosher food, of halal food, <clears throat> foods that, that, that are very much associated with a particular religion or belief, and there can be cheating there by people setting out to make more money. <clears throat> There's even fraud associated with bonded labour. And this was a story, a big story that appeared in the UK a couple of years ago, where <clears throat> the shrimp industry in Thailand was shown to have bonded labour, another form of cheating. One of my very good PhD students a number of years ago looked at the impacts of milk fraud on food safety and particular emphasis on developing countries. And a lot of this work we studied India itself. And we found more than 50 different ways that 
fraud was being perpetrated in milk. Not only were there safety implications, but also there were implications about the nutritional value of the milk itself because it was being diluted down and, and uh, particularly young children were, were suffering from nutritional deficiencies because of the cheating. We can even have environmental impacts of fraud, particularly around fishing, where you get fishing happening in areas where fishing stocks are depleted. So you can see there are many, many different aspects to fraud. Now, the first case study I want to talk to you about is a tip-off that I received about five years ago. And it happened locally in the UK, but became an international scandal. And it was around herbs and spices. <clears throat> I was told there was massive cheating, particularly in the herb oregano. Oh, oregano is familiar to many of us. <clears throat> you buy the little 20 gram or 30 gram jars in the stores and in the supermarkets. It can also be added to many, many different types of foods, particularly Italian foods. And the fraud itself <clears throat> isn't around the oregano leaves, which you can see very clearly what they look like, their shape, their morphology. But like many type, different types of herbs, they get dried and they get crushed. <clears throat> and then they get uh, added into many, many different food products. And it's these crushed products. <laughs> so here we have four different types of oregano that, that we studied. But actually, they're not oregano. <clears throat> this one is crushed myrtle leaves. This one crushed olive leaves. This one crushed sister's leaves. And in fact, we only have one genuine oregano. And the cheating is the blending of these different types of leaves together the very high value oregano being diluted with a low value or no value adulterants. When I first started to look at this five years ago, the gold standard was to use microscopy. So you look down a microscope and see if you can see different fragments of different leaves. Analytically, unbelievably challenging. You needed very, very, very skilled people to do it and you are lucky if they could detect maybe 25 or 30 percent levels of adulteration. So myself and my research group, we started to think about what new ways could we use analytical chemistry to try to detect this fraud. And the idea was to produce fingerprints, food fingerprints that could help identify species, breed, geographic origin, many, many different assets and facets of food. This idea of fingerprinting is the fingerprint matches that food or it doesn't. We can go to a traffic light where we test it and we get a green light, everything is okay. We test it, we get a red light, something is not right about that particular food. We've done a huge amount of work on the use of molecular spectroscopy to produce these types of fingerprints. <clears throat> In the case of oregano, we used FTIR, and we undertook multiple scans of oregano and the adulterants collected from many, many different parts of the world. And the scans <clears throat> might look very, very similar, but then when we apply statistical analysis, chemometrics to this, we can produce very nice statistical models that will separate out the genuine oregano, which is in the orange, from all of the different adulterants that we have tried to, to uh, identify. And then we can produce mixtures and blends of those, and again, start to develop models where we can not only say that there's an adulterant present, but give an indication of how much the adulterant was. Based on our method validation, <coughs> we were getting a, a measurement predictions in the region of about 95%, very, very high success rates for a very rapid, low-cost screening test. But we wanted to get a even more powerful form of analysis, because 95% is good, but if you want to take somebody to court, prosecute them, cancel contracts, you need a higher level of certainty. So we sweat, we <coughs> turned our attention to the science of metabolomics and using high resolution mass spectrometry started to screen the metabolome of oregano 
looking for markers, clusters of biomarkers, which would give an indication that it was genuine oregano or clusters of biomarkers that would give an indication that it was the adulterants themselves. We used time of flight mass spectrometry and started to produce these ion maps, and very complicated ion maps of the genuine material and the adulterated material. <clears throat> and again, they'll look unbelievably similar, but by applying very good statistical measurements, by applying the chemometrics, again, we could pull out the features that gave the distinct classification, whether it was genuine or adulterated oregano. So here we have the results of many, many analyses undertaken by time of flight mass spectrometry on oregano. On the left of the slide, you can see there are a cluster of, 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 of samples within the green circle. <clears throat> and within that circle, you can see actually two distinct clusters. And actually, that's oregano that originates from Europe and Asia. <clears throat> and the bottom cluster is oregano that originates from Central and Southern America. So not only can we tell it's oregano, we can actually tell the, the continent that it came from. And all of those samples that sit outside that circle were adulterated with one of many, many different types of, of oregano that, that uh, we have uh, uh, found <coughs> to be used. But we published our work in food chemistry in terms of this uh, comprehensive strategy to detect the adulteration of herbs. <clears throat> it, it's something that we were very proud of. But we decided to go a little bit further and we undertook a survey of oregano that was on sale in the UK and Ireland, either through stores and shops or from the internet. What we were very surprised to find that 25% of all of the oregano on sale in the UK and Ireland was adulterated in some way. <clears throat> this was really quite a surprise to us. But then <clears throat> this story that we published went viral right across the world and we started to get samples of oregano coming from many, many different countries. <clears throat> this is the example of Australia who sent us 12 different commercial brands of oregano and in Australia, it was seven out of 12 of the samples were oregano adulterated. And some of them had less than 10% of oregano in it. So the fraud that was happening in Australia was massive. And as a result of this work, two of the companies that were selling the oregano were prosecuted by the Australian authorities. Well, I can show you many examples around the world. This one happens to be Norway, where the same thing happened. <coughs> We got samples, we tested them using our spectroscopy and high resolution mass spectrometry and found evidence of adulteration. So we've had samples from many countries around the world and <clears throat> on average about 25% of all of the samples of oregano that we have tested have shown themselves to be adulterated. And I would be very keen to get some samples to come from India to test in our, in our, in our uh, uh, testing methodologies, so please feel free to send me any samples and we will analyze them. Now, when we went to look at the fraud, <clears throat> uh, a lot of oregano in, in uh, Europe <clears throat> originates from Turkey, and we started to look at the production data for oregano in Turkey. The year that the fraud was highlighted to me was very interesting because Turkey produced less than 12,000 metric tons of oregano and exported more than 14,000 tons of oregano. So very, very clearly massive fraud happening. And now <coughs> we, we can see that the mass balance, the amount of oregano produced and, and uh, sold very, very much correlates with each other. And it's very interesting that in Turkey, what the producers of oregano are told that Chris Elliott at Queen's University is testing your production, so time to stop cheating. That's the power of analytical chemistry. Now, I wanted to give you a second case study in terms of the use of fingerprinting. And this time, <coughs> again, we're going to use advanced mass spectrometry, time of flight mass spectrometry, but this time we have attached it to what's called 
the Reams laser source. <clears throat> so this is a surgeon's scalpel attached to a laser. And what we do is <clears throat> we cut into the sample with the scalpel. We switch the laser on and it burns the sample and the smoke from the burn gets injected into the mass spec. And within a few seconds, we get a profile, uh, particularly of the phospholipids that are present in the sample. Now, in terms of, of looking at the species that a foodstuff is, very commonly some form of gel work will be done, either protein gels or nucleic acid gels. These are really quite expensive and they take quite a long time to complete. So what we set out to do was to see if we could use this RIMS technology to differentiate between five different whitefish. <clears throat> And those species are called cod, coli, haddock, pollock, and whiting. Genetically very similar, so a very challenging uh, uh, experiment for us to do. We collected together nearly 500 samples of the fish, and we uh, started to analyze the fatty acids and the glycophospholipids using the RIMS technology. And what we found is when we looked at these different species, Actually, the phospholipid profiles were very, very different, and it was quite easy to tell this apart. So taking this data, doing the statistical analysis, the chemometrics again, we can see that we can very, very clearly identify the different species of fish through the different clusters. <clears throat> very, very accurate way to measure the species of fish. And the analysis only takes about five or 10 seconds unbelievably quick. So the great innovation of this technique that we call the eye knife is that we take a sample, we can scan it, and within two or three seconds, we will get a result. And the validation of our model comes to about 99% accurate. So a very, very innovative way of, of, of doing analysis for species using mass spectrometry. Now, we collect a huge amount of data, masses amount of data when we were doing this metabolic fingerprinting by reams. And one of my very good PhD students at the time took the data and he went and analyzed it. And actually, not only could he tell the species of the fish, he could tell how the fish was being captured, whether it was by trawler or by line and pole just again by doing the chemometric modeling. So massive amount of data there. And really what we're doing is we're detecting two different types of fraud in fishing, uh, species substitution, and also the catch method with one single analytical test. Then we decided to look at another challenge. We call it the three sin challenge. And this was, could we identify the species the geographical origin and the production method of shrimp in a single untargeted metabolomics approach. This project was done by a good friend of mine, uh, Naladri. I hope Naladri, you're listening to this. Naladri got a very prestigious fellowship to come to, to my laboratory at Queen's University to do this work. And together we collected five different types of shrimp king prawns, tiger prawns, Argentinian red shrimp, Indian white shrimps, and Indian pink shrimps. And the idea was, could we tell the species, the geographic origins in a single test? <clears throat> and again, very, very quickly, the ability to measure these uh, different types of king prawn using metabolomics what was identified very quickly in time of flight mass spectrometry. And again, the same principle was applied is that within two or three seconds of, of measuring the, the presence of the phospholipids in these uh, different types of prawns, we, we could get a result very quickly. We've now started to take an, a, a large study in the UK and Ireland to determine if there's any shrimp fraud happening here at the moment. So in terms of what are the next types of sins that we will investigate in terms of food fraud, a scandal that broke in Europe last year was about fraud in tuna. <clears throat> and 
what we have is the before and after, and what we have is very, very low quality, poor grade tuna that should be used for pet food was, was being uh, chemically modified to make it look like very fresh tuna. And that fraud is happening through the injection of some chemicals and also carbon monoxide into the tuna to bring back that coloration. So this is something that we want to investigate further using our fingerprinting technique. How will we do this? Well, we will again use this type of ambient mass spectrometry where sample preparation is absolutely minimal. And we're very lucky to be what we call a centre of innovation with Waters Corporation and we have many different types of ambient mass spectrometry to do this. But in our research group at the moment, we're investigating many di different types of fraud. We continue our fight against the fraud in herbs and spices in seafood, but also we're doing a massive amount of work on rice. <clears throat> and we have collected some incredible data using different technology platforms where we can tell the type of rice, the country that it comes from. We're also doing a lot of work with, with meat fraud as well. But always the next question is, what will be the next type of fraud that we investigate? And we're very, very keen to work with collaborators across the world. If you think you've identified a problem, if you think you want to work with my research group to develop new cutting edge, innovative analytical tests to detect the fraud, please let me know. We love to work with people across the world. We love to work with people in India. So you have an open in invitation. Please contact me and I would be delighted to develop some sort of collaboration. So this is the end of my, my uh, lecture. I hope, you, I hope it's given you a bit of a flavor about how analytical chemistry, really good analytical chemistry, can fight the bad guys in the world's food system. Thank you very much for your attention.